I'm going to um, just skip by the uh, the facetious question and say Dublin politics. Why do we need another lawyer? But now <laughs> the more interesting point, Frank, I uh, I found about yourself is is that you had a very interesting experience in the U.S. Tell uh, people about that. You were an intern over there, and uh, and again, I also found one of the uh, the places that you worked with, which was the AFL CIO, quite interesting in that regard. So just share with us uh, wh how you came about that and what you uh, wh what gains you, if you like, uh, came to you from that. That's right, yeah. Well, I, I suppose I spent three stints in uh, Washington, and the first was as a student, and I spent an intern, uh, or summer as an intern, in the office of Ted Kennedy mm -hmm. on Capitol Hill. He's no relation, no I'm relation. afraid. <laughs> no, not at all. But um, it, was, uh, it was an incredible experience mm -hmm. um, because... Uh, they, they do that internship system very well in the States and they've done it for a long time where they encourage students and young people in to be exposed to politics at the front line and obviously I suppose being Irish and having you know by American terms Democratic Party uh, inclinations it was a great opportunity and I really I mean the most remarkable thing about it was all the people I met many of whom were the other interns mm -hmm. um, so I also found they were very trusting in Washington. You know, here was I, I was uh, 21 at the time, mm -hmm. a student from Dublin, they didn't know me at all, but they had no hesitation in allocating real responsibility mm -hmm. to you. Um, Michael, just seeing as you okay. asked uh, about the AFL-CIO, yeah. um, that was a, a separate summer. I, I loved Washington, so I went back. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I went back with something called the Washington Ireland Program, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a student uh, program open to any student from the north or the south. Mm -hmm. uh, to spend a summer in DC and you're allocated an internship and they have great internships and anyone who's a student who's listening I just really encourage them to look into it it's a really fantastic initiative mm -hmm. but I was um, assigned uh, a, a place called the Solidarity Centre Did you choose the AFL-CIO which we should yeah. uh, uh, just inform listeners is the equivalent of the ICTU it's the, That's uh, right it, it's, a, it's a main yes. labour union well it's a main no. labour body is the way I would put it. No, I, I didn't choose it. Um, I, I, I didn't really make any choice in mm. that uh, about half the internships on the Washington Ireland program are on Capitol Hill mm -hmm. with congressmen, uh, representatives or senators. I had done that the previous summer, mm -hmm. so there was no point in doing that again. Had I not done that, I certainly would have mm. actively lobbied for that. But after that, uh, I really left it up to them, and they had places like the World Bank or ABC News. Mm -hmm. um, so they assigned me to AFL-CIO, which, as you say, is mm -hmm. the, broadly speaking the equivalent of of it to it's the labour movement in America, and uh, it was it was fascinating. But there's just one thing I should say about it, Michael. It wasn't the AFL-CIO in terms of its day-to-day -day operations in the United States. It was a wing of it okay. called the Solidarity Center, which is funded by the AFL-CIO, but which promotes the labor movement in countries where labor rights are either non-existent or very, very radically weaker than they are in... But like the missions for the... Uh, the well, <laughs> somewhat, yes. yes. I mean, yeah. places... Yeah, and, and that was fascinating. So you're really working at a very basic level to try and enforce international labour organisation basic rights that workers all over the world oh. but but I, 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 it is interesting Michael because I think there would be some members of Dublin City Council uh, mm. who if they just saw me walking off the street might be surprised to know that I'd spent a summer with the labour movement in, yeah. in Washington. Did, both of these um, uh, if you like projects um, did they influence the direction your career took in law or uh, w would that have been uh, entirely separate from that? Um, Truthfully, I think they would be entirely separate. Okay. Um, they would have influenced me in one respect, in that when I was an undergrad, uh, I'm the youngest of six kids, and uh, three of my siblings emigrated, and they've all become US citizens okay. um, by naturalization. Um, and I suppose because so many of my older brothers and sisters had done it, I thought about it myself, and I wanted to live, I, I, as a student I spent some time in France as well, so I wanted to live in a few different places and see what opportunities were out there. But the real influence of those summers on me in a long-term sense was the fact that I decided that Ireland and Dublin is actually where I want to live. And okay. so I, I, I spent one other, after I graduated, I spent a year with a brilliant Irish-American organization called the US-Ireland Alliance. I had a great year working for it, but it was really during that year that I decided uh, that ultimately I wanted to be based in Dublin. 
and the bar was the natural career choice for me. Uh, yes, I appreciate that. But what um, are you um, more focused on civil law or criminal law? I'm focused entirely on civil law, okay. um, so I, I don't practice any criminal law at all. And um, it's one of the things that uh, I think a better job should be done explaining to law students how, how specialised the bar is. I know that's not the subject of this programme, mm -hmm. but um, definitely uh, the days I think certainly in Dublin, are gone where you might have a barrister who has a finger in every pie. Mm -hmm. Moving on, uh, Frank, there's a new council there, it's a bigger council, it's quite a different council in terms of the configuration of the council, if you like, the makeup mm -hmm. of the council. Now, I want to start off by asking, and I'm, uh, something I noticed, and I had a look at the city council for Dublin, Ohio. Uh, <laughs> now, one of the things we've uh, complained about on this program is that the Dublin City Council seems to manage to turn a one and a half hour meeting into a three and a half hour mm -hmm. meeting. How do you feel about that in the sense that people say everybody, you know, it's a democracy, people have to have their say. But what I'm actually seeing is, I would suggest, is quite an inefficient way. Uh, it, it largely generates into a talk shop rather mm -hmm. than a decision making body. How do you come down on that one? Uh, or is it too early to say? Well, I suppose, I'm not trying to cop out, Michael, but I think it is quite early uh, mm -hmm. to make a decision, certainly for me as a new mm -hmm. council, because I, I maybe draw a comparison between a number of, I've attended, mm -hmm. I, I think, four council meetings of the whole city council at this mm -hmm. stage, and the, the two which have taken place so far in September, one which is the normal meeting and mm -hmm. one which is on the incinerator this week, I felt were um, much more productive meetings, mm -hmm. uh, they ran I think a little bit more smoothly and I think maybe for the first couple of meetings which definitely took a long time and, mm -hmm. and you know people were, some people were, were uh, well able to talk, mm -hmm. um, I think that maybe there's just a little bit of a bedding down period. Okay. So if, if, if in a year's time council meetings were like the first one that I attended in, in, in June, well that was actually really the second one I attended mm -hmm. in July. I'd be in a state of despair, but I'm not sure that will be the case. Yeah, there seems to be an awful lot of uh, extraordinary meetings these days that wasn't there. Is that a, a, a consequence of the new council, or had, uh, well, what's your interpretation of that? I think that the, it does seem at the moment, but I think September is a particularly busy time of the year. So there was there was a meeting in July that was extraordinary uh, because. It, it was decided very correctly, I think, by the Lord Mayor that there should be a special meeting to discuss the housing crisis. Mm -hmm. And then this month there was a special meeting also to discuss the uh, pool bag incinerator project. Mm -hmm. And there's also going to be another special meeting at the end of the month to discuss the budget. Um, but I don't think that's going to be the default position. I think you'll probably have one meeting a month. Okay. How Something that I've started to notice, and I just wonder how you feel about this, is that I... Um, Thanks to Dublin City Council, you don't have to spend three and a half hours watching, uh, sitting at a meeting as, uh, as in the press gallery. You can now either watch mm -hmm. it as it happens, or as I do, watch it the next morning. Mm. Sometimes you look at it. You, you mm. know, I look at yourself, Frank, and you are always smartly dressed in there. You pay deference to the office, is the way I would do it. But sometimes I look there and I think, am I looking at the student bar up at DIT? Uh, is there room for improvement? I'm not, I'm not going to make comments about how people should and shouldn't, but I just find it loses some of its gravitas when you see a guy who's in there in a t-shirt, is all I will put it. Well, I'd be reluctant, Michael, to criticise someone for, you know, the, the way in which they choose to dress at a council meeting. I, it's true, I, you know, I tend, uh, largely because I tend to be coming from work to be in a sure. suit myself, and um, uh, I... It's very nice to know someone's watching the meeting cycle, <laughs> but, um, but I, I, I'd be reluctant to get you know too fixated about that. What I will say is that I do think it is very important, though, that there is an atmosphere of respect mm -hmm. that operates across the chamber. And I've actually said relatively little so far. I spoke certainly on the Poolbeg incinerator meeting, mm -hmm. but I, I want to learn and you know to of course. Uh, f find out how the the chamber operates, but. Um, I do think that when you have very diverse views, and you've alluded to this, mm -hmm. Michael, that uh, if you profoundly disagree with someone, um, even if you think their view is almost abhorrent, I, I think it's very important nonetheless to maintain that level of respect, because every single person in that room 
has a, a mandate from their own constituency. Um, and I wouldn't be concerned about dress dance or anything like that, but I'd certainly be prepared if someone, my view is, has the floor from the chair, then they're entitled to be heard in a respectful silence. Yeah. No, I, I would agree with you internally, Frank. I just find that occasionally people are losing that uh, distinction between the office and the person. Mm -hmm. uh, the office is there to represent us all. Um, and, and I just find if you look as though you perhaps, if you came in in a set of board shorts and a singlet, Probably wouldn't do wonders for the credibility of the council. That's the that's the only point I'd, uh, I would make in that regard. Sure, and it's not that I, I, I disagree with the aspiration. I think it would be very nice, um, but it's not something that I would see as, as a priority. Mm -hmm. And I'd also distinguish it maybe from, say, a parliament like the Dáil, you mm -hmm. know, where I do think it's important that a, a certain... Um, where there are very strict rules of procedure and only members are allowed in the chamber. But the city council, it is a more... Um, inviting environment, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, and there are it's occasionally addressed by non-members and so on. So, um, it, it it would be maybe not the top priority, but I'd, I'd share your aspiration. Okay. I will then put you on the spot and say, <laughs> barristers, wigs or no wigs? <laughs> no, feel free to actually. I'm a no wigs man. Uh, and, so, that's uh, probably because yeah. of all those years you were corrupted in the U.S. watching their legal system. <laughs> I tell you what, it is actually. It's mm -hmm. when you're running around in the four courts with a pile of papers, as has happened to me, and you get your gown caught in a fire extinguisher yeah. or, uh, you know, a rail and you fall over. It's mm. just very inconvenient. Yeah. It's not that long ago they used to turn up at Dublin City Council with those gowns yes. as well. I, yes. uh, that, uh, I would say, is perhaps being a bit over the top, mm. but there's a balance, isn't sure. there? Sure. Yeah. Frank, an area that um, you represent, uh, Pembroke South Dock, uh, very much part of that is the Rings End area, um, Sandy Mount area. The issue of the incinerator, um, I just want to put two things to you. First of all, Dublin City Council voted overwhelmingly uh, to reject the incinerator. I think it was 52 to 50, uh, 52 to 2. Yeah. I'm not going to ask you yeah. if you're one of the two, I suspect <laughs> yeah. you weren't. But the sad reality is, is that in most instances you would think that's the end of it. But it really isn't. It's a symbolic vote, isn't it, as much as anything else. It has no, st it has no status in itself. Well, it, it may have no status okay. in itself, yeah, and just for the avoidance of any doubt, I was one of the 52, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> and uh, there were there were two motions before the uh, City mm. Council, two emergency motions. Uh, one of them actually was proposed by myself and a colleague of mine, Jim O'Callaghan, mm -hmm. uh, on Dublin City Council, and uh, we simply uh, proposed a motion that directed the Chief Executive that the works notified should not proceed. That's fine. Uh, that was passed, okay. uh, 52 to 2, and there was a separate motion also put down, which was passed by the same number, uh, effectively, and uh, I supported that and, uh, and so on. Now, um, the, the understanding that was conveyed to councillors mm -hmm. is that this is not a decision that is what's called a reserved function. In other words, it's not the remit of the council. Exactly. Yeah. It falls within the ambit of the man who used to be called the city manager, uh, he's now the chief executive, Owen Keegan. Yeah. And the only element of ambiguity that arises is that um, the meeting took place under a, a provision, not to bore your listeners, but under a provision of the Local Government Act. Mm -hmm. And there's another provision of that act that seems to say if a meeting takes place under the act, it can be opposed by a resolution of the members, or a vote of the members. So, Jim and I just made sure that we certainly, our motion was framed in such a way that it invoked that language. So, they'll have to go off and take a legal opinion on it anyway. But, the bottom line is that it very, very well may proceed, and if it does, it is in the face of cross-party and almost unanimous opposition of the elected uh, representatives. Most, if, if that was in a parliamentary context, mm -hmm. uh, you would say this is a constitutional crisis in the sense that you've got uh, unelected officials mm -hmm. overriding essentially the will mm -hmm. of elected officials, as you say, people who have a mandate. Mm -hmm. How does that play out here then? I mean, um, how would, I don't want, it's mm -hmm. a hypothetical as sure. to what Owen Keegan is trying to do, but um, other than unease between uh, mm -hmm. how the if it's not quite the legislature yeah. and the executive operate, yeah. but um, is that w would there be any substantive fallout? I suppose is the issue uh, if the uh, the city manager exercised his uh, legal prerogative. 
Well, or certainly, leave the judgment, sorry, I would... Uh, th there's yeah. certainly no um, constitutional issue. I mean, the reason that the city manager has these powers is because they were conferred upon him by the Oireachtas. So yes. it was, it's underpinned by a parliamentary decision. Um, but it's a very sad state of affairs in my mind because um, it doesn't reflect the will either of the elected representatives or of the people. I mean, last night, uh, Jim and I were out uh, knocking on doors in Ring's End just mm. to update people and, and to sound them out again on their views. And there's universal opposition to it. Mm. And uh, it's just unfortunate. And one of the things that I did know when I was running mm. for the council, I won't pretend that I didn't, but that has really only been, the reality of which has only been brought home to me since being elected, that actually there are very few powers of councillors that fall within what are called reserved functions. And when you have a mandate, and when people are expecting you to deliver on that mandate, it's it's quite disappointing and frustrating. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, understand exactly where you're coming from on that one. Now, councillors have said this to me time and time mm -hmm. again over the years, that um, you go in there on the hustings and then the reality is somewhat different. Can I then come back to you, Frank? The motion that yourself and uh, Jim put, now you're both lawyers and I both appreciate that uh, it would have a legal foundation. Did you come up with an alternative uh, other than to say stop the work? Well, the or, or notion of coming up with an alternative is... A, 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 I mean, it's a seismic ambition. Okay. And so the simple answer is no, in the sense that we were presented with only two options okay. uh, by the city manager. And, and this is uh, not a criticism, um, but it's simply a statement of fact that there were a number of reports that were circulated to councillors on Friday of last week, and I read them all over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And it said in stark terms, our choices are a proceed or abandon the project. Okay. Now, there is a separate issue, and I think no doubt this is what you're referring to, Michael, what to do with the waste. Yeah. But in terms of to proceed or not to proceed, at the moment, the focus is simply to stop a project that uh, neither I nor Jim nor 50 other of the elected representatives agree with. Okay, yeah. The way I would um, perhaps approach that in the short term, uh, uh, Frank, is to put it to you from the business perspective. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is a lot of money has been yes. already put into it. Is it essentially saying that has to now be written off? Is there any way any of that can be salvaged? Um, to be completely truthful with you, Michael, almost, or in the case of almost all of the money, yes, it is. Now, there's, the caveat is that there's the value of the site. Mm -hmm. So this, you could sell the site and you could realise some money on that, or you could do something fantastic with mm -hmm. the site. Mm -hmm. But what I would say to you, Michael, is that it's wrong in my mind to look at this decision as being one to recover money that's been spent, okay. because that money has in large part been wasted already. Okay. About, of the 100 million or so, about 30 million has been spent on consultancy, mm -hmm. um, media contracts, public relations and so on, that is irrecoverable mm -hmm. in the sense that it's been spent. It's operational expenses, And similarly, so the site was purchased for approximately, I think, 50 million euro. Mm -hmm. It's now worth 5 million euro. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, if you proceed with the site, uh, or if you proceed with the project, well, you're using the site for the purpose that it was purchased for, but it still doesn't change the fact that it was an extremely bad value purchase. Yeah, yeah. So the point that I would make, Michael, really, is that that money, it's not wasting it to abandon the project. It's a terrible shame, but the, almost all, but not all, the entirety of that money was wasted already. Okay. Is the principle, uh, just, and I, uh, I'm not going to uh, rehash, uh, ground we've gone over. What did you get the feeling of the council was? Is it uh, is the objection, is it economic, uh, is it business, uh, is it environmental? Um, it's not clear. So, uh, if I sure. go to the Green Party they'll no. probably tell me it's yeah. environmental. Somebody yeah. else will tell me something different. Well, well there, are, there are a range of objections mm -hmm. and I mean it's funny we've alluded to how diverse the council is mm -hmm. and it, I can't really synopsize the various, I mean I could list them off but maybe if I just outlined what my primary okay. concerns are and I think these are reflective mm -hmm. of the vast majority of, of members of the council. So simply put the effect on the residents is uh, a massive increase in the volume of traffic that will okay. be coming in. You know, heavy goods vehicles coming in, about 120 of them every single day into the area. 
And a further, the problem is compounded by the scale of the incinerator because uh, at full capacity it can take 550,000 tonnes of waste per annum. Mm -hmm. Now, in fact, the four Dublin local authorities combined, South Dublin, Fingal, Dunleary and ourselves in Dublin City, produce certainly less than 400,000 at the moment. Yeah. So you need, there, there, are, there are two things that you do. You either import waste from elsewhere. Now, the city council says you take it from the rest of Leinster, mm -hmm. but maybe you yeah. need to take it from as far as Kerry or Donegal, or maybe because of its location, and this is a concern of some of the residents, that waste is going to be imported. Mm -hmm. And there are, there is a further concern there, which is that, you know, Dubliners have very understandable, uh, enormous complaints about waste and waste management. But one area where Dublin, and it's to the credit of the residents, has made enormous progress in recent years is in recycling. Mm -hmm. And my concern is that this incinerator project may actually lead to what the economists would call perverse incentives. Mm -hmm. It would discourage recycling in order to create volumes of waste to mm -hmm. be pushed into this incinerator. That's one concern. There are also environmental concerns. I think these, they've, these have been teased out and mm -hmm. I won't go through those necessarily. A further concern is that once the waste has been burnt, and this is really an environmental concern, as I understand it, a significant percentage of it remains to be disposed of in the ash, you know, anyway. And the disposal of that is, is problematical. Um, and then, certainly, aside from the concerns about the pool bag incinerator itself, I think every councillor is very dissatisfied with the fact that their views on it are disregarded. And that is another reason, I think. I guess so. Frank, I want to move on because mm. something, uh, uh, two things that have been um, uh, cropping up over the last uh, uh, couple of weeks, uh, water charges. Um, mm. There's been again a very diverse uh, range of opinion. Mm. Dublin City Council passed a contentious motion mm. about that. What's your uh, view uh, on water charges? Well, I mean, it's, it's a complex issue, but it, it is a complex issue. Are they issue. inevitable, I suppose, is the first question. Well, as things stand, I mean, certainly to uh, take the position, I mean, we have a government that's in office and that is uh, pushing ahead with them. So I think shy of some major change in the composition of the Oireachtas in the short term, uh, yes, they are inevitable. Yeah. And uh, it is, I think you've put your finger on it, Michael, when you say that it is a very complex issue mm -hmm. because... I do have concerns about the fact that uh, water is a very precious resource and it can be used uh, in a reckless volume by some people. So what I would like to see is a situation where you have what some people might call a generous, I would term it maybe a fair allowance mm -hmm. to every household, recognising its importance as a resource. But I do sympathize with the idea that you need to charge for consumption after a certain point because it does cost money to uh, prepare the water to service people mm -hmm. and I think I remember during uh, a big freeze a couple of years ago there was a water shortage and the way some a small number of very irresponsible people reacted was that they actually left their taps on overnight to ensure that their pipes didn't freeze if the consumption is at that level, then you need to disincentivize it. And uh, the only other point that I'd make on the water charges is that there are an awful lot of leaks in the system at the moment, and I do think it is inappropriate to institute charges until these leaks have been resolved, because there may be a situation where people are paying for water that they're not using themselves. But I, I think you put your finger on it and you say that it's complex, and I don't take, you know, a populist view on it. Okay. Frank, we would love to talk to you about uh, housing, mm -hmm. we would love to talk to you about local property charges, maybe we will do that another day, but uh, just last one, before we go, yeah. the budget is the only way that Dublin City Council can hit back mm -hmm. about the executive. Mm -hmm. Is that Turkey's voting for an early Christmas if you were to deny supply? Well, over the incinerator. It's, I mean, the thing is, if you vote against the budget, yep. um, then you defeat the budget, but you also shut down the council. That's what I'm saying. So, <laughs> um, as to whether it's Turkey's voting for Christmas, well, yes, I think it is. But you shouldn't pass a budget at any cost. 
uh, that goes without saying. And it is something that council watchers like yourself, Michael, have observed from the very moment that this council was elected that the biggest challenge it faces is going to be passing a budget because you have parties uh, like Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael that historically would have passed many budgets in this city council that are now in opposition. Yes, it's going to be fascinating to watch. Frank Kennedy, thank you for your time today. You've been listening to Council Matters. Stay tuned for Midweek Music Miscellany.